just want to welcome you uh, to worship with us this morning, both those of you in this room, also those joining us online. Great to be back in the Lord's house. We didn't miss you guys last Sunday, but hope you enjoy the time out. It's something that's kind of rare these days in Arkansas, right? Over a foot of snow. I know my girls and I had a great time sledding some very dangerous hills, and by the grace of God, nothing was broken. So I hope that was the case for all of you as well. Uh, just one thing we would ask you to do, we ask you every week, if you would just kind of let us know that you're here, even though you're right in front of me, it's great to have a registration of that, and also those of you online. You can do so very simply by texting GSFBC and then your name to the number 94000. And we give you permission to pull your phones out right now, even in here, and go ahead and do that for us. Just helps us to make sure we're staying in contact with you as the body. So again, that's GSFBC and your name to 94000. Well, something else I'm very excited to be able to announce. Hopefully you've seen this already. But next Sunday, we get to start small groups back for all ages. Or Sunday school, as some of you may know that. So yes, absolutely. We it's been a long time, but we appreciate your patience as we're just trying to, to work through what our country is currently experiencing, but very excited to be able to gather together again in that discipleship setting. So uh, you can again look at your emails for more details, but we'll again have Sunday School for Adults at 8.15. Our worship services will stay at the 9.30 hour, and then 11 o'clock will be when we have those Sunday School classes for all ages, kids through adults. So I hope you're already making plans to come to that. If you want to find out more information, our website has all the details on it. Also for you ladies, our women's ministry this Saturday will be having Woven on Mission. That's going to look a little different than Woven in the past, so I hope you'll plan to come. You can find out more about it on our website, gsfbc.org slash women. It is a, an event that requires registration. It's a $10 fee, but you can also do that on our website. I hope you'll plan to be there. It starts at 930 this Saturday. We'll have a brunch and a guest speaker and just a time to really uh, think about service in that orientation. So I hope you'll plan to be there. Uh, lastly, just wanted to mention that next Sunday we will have a deacon ordination service. So I hope you just start praying for that. We have one man who's coming in to take that office and to receive that ordination. So be praying for that service and I hope you'll plan to be a part of that. Well, this morning we have the great opportunity, as I mentioned, to worship together as the body of Christ. And what a privilege that is that we serve a great and awesome God who's not only our creator, but also our savior. The one who has taken us, who created us in his image to glorify him across the nations. But in our rebellion against him, we fall short of that. But in his grace, he has redeemed us back to his image bearers. Having never completely lost it, just being distorted, but through our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we now have the opportunity and the privilege to worship him. Now that's something that we come here together as a body and do. But it's also something that is not just relegated to this building and this hour. It is something we can do every day in every moment as believers in Jesus Christ. And for those of you who may in this, be in this room or online who are maybe new to Christianity or don't really understand what worship stands for, what we, what we do when we sing may seem a little strange to you, but it's the overflow of our gratitude and our thanksgiving to our creator God who stepped into our life, who humbled himself by sending his son Jesus Christ to die for our sins. Where we rebelled against him, he created us to glorify him, but we sought to glorify ourselves instead. And he stepped into our lives and redeemed us. That is why we worship him. And he is worthy of worship. And what we do here today and in our lives is just the very beginning of what we will do for eternity in heaven. And you've heard this passage before, but it's a great passage to remind us as we see this vision in heaven in Revelation chapter 4, starting in verse 8, says this. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night, they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, who is, and who is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created we pray with me heavenly father you are worthy of worship lord forgive us that in our pride we seek to worship ourselves and our own actions and forget that you are the only one worthy of worship you told us in your word that you will not share your glory with another 
So Lord, I pray this morning our hearts would be humbled and that you would receive the praise that you are worthy of. May your people to declare that you are worthy of all power and honor and glory. And may you be pleased with the offering that we give to you this morning.
coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. He's coming on the clouds. The kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break. His broken hearts declare his praise. For who can stop the Lord all Our God. And our God is the lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before you. Our God is the Lamb. some great worship this morning. I was just uh, on our first couple of numbers imagining what it's going to be like to sing about the holiness of God and the presence of God. It's going to be an incredible thing. Well, this morning as we come to our time of prayer, I want to take it just a minute and highlight uh, one of our ministries is kind of behind the scenes, and that is our preschool ministry. For those of you who don't know her, this is Mandy Horton. Uh, she directs that ministry for us. And you started, was it right about the time COVID hit or right before COVID hit? Um, I think I started in May. In, in May. Co- yeah, and COVID okay. hit March. So. so it's been just a constant pivot and yes, change. it's been and very unnormal. <laughs> very unnormal. That's a good way to put it. Well, we wanted to, to take just a minute this morning. I know 
COVID's been tough for a lot of different groups of people, but, you know, I think often, especially when, uh, and this wasn't COVID related, like last week when the preschool center was closed because of the weather, I just can't imagine young parents, all the things they've had to do during COVID, quarantining them, their kids, all that. What's something, what's a way that we can pray for young adult families during this season? Yeah, so... We've had some families that have been faithfully coming through COVID, but we've had a lot of families that we haven't seen for a year. Mm, And we've had babies that have been born that have never been in our preschool ministry. So I would just pray that our families would be wanting and yearning to come back to church and that they would feel safe returning and knowing that we're ready for them to be back. Good. Yeah, the procedures you guys go through are just astounding to me, all of the cleaning and different procedures and all. So I appreciate all y'all are doing to make it a safe place. Anything else that we could pray specifically just for preschool ministry? Yeah, so um, if you've been in preschool ministry before, you know a lot of our Sunday school teachers and volunteers are older in that bracket that are not safe to serve right now. So I would pray that you would pray that there would be a spot for you in preschool we need volunteers all the time to help with worship care and we need help for Sunday school teachers that's our greatest need right now with Sunday school returning next week we've got a lot of Sunday school teachers that still aren't able to return Mm -hmm. so perhaps some who've never done that because of the time that we're in maybe God's going to call them to step up and, and help in that area yes definitely I would just my prayer is that our people would be open and receptive to what God is calling them to do and that they would just spend time with God and to see if God has a place for them in preschool. We'd love to have you there. Good. Well, thank you for your leadership. I know it's a tough season and a lot of what you do is kind of behind the scenes, but I so appreciate your leadership and your whole team um, as we work together to effectively minister to preschoolers so we can also minister to young adult families. So we're going we're gonna to pray for that. We're also going to pray for three uh, lost names this morning, as we try to do each week, Maddie and uh, Graham and Ethan. Uh, we want to pray that they have opportunity to hear the message of the gospel and respond to that message. So would you bow with me as we pray together? And first of all, let's take just a moment, as Mandy has requested, and, and pray for our young adult parents. Many of them have been uh, overly cautious. We understand that. But as things are beginning to return to some semblance of normal, pray that they remember the importance of being in God's house and fellowship believers and having their children here as well, that they'll feel safe and secure in that. So let's take a moment and, and pray for that. And then we want to pray for leaders, uh, especially for teachers and people to uh, help with worship care in preschool. And, you know, as we pray that, um, we need to recognize that as we're praying, God may reveal to us we're the answer to that prayer. So let's pray and ask God to uh, put it on the hearts of those who need to step up during this time and help us care for and minister to preschoolers. And finally, let's pray for Maddie, for Graham, for Ethan, that they would have opportunity even this week to hear the message of the gospel. Pray that the Spirit would draw them to Christ. And pray for the member of our body who turned in, the three members who turned in these three names, that they would have opportunity and they would open their mouths and let the Spirit speak through them. Father, we've lifted up these prayers this morning because we want our heart to be in line with your heart, and your heart is for those who don't know Christ. So, Father, we pray for those that you have given us specific influence over, whether they be friends or neighbors or coworkers or family members. God, we pray that we would remember the privilege and the responsibility we have to share. Father, we thank you for the ministry you have given us as a church with preschoolers and young adult families and pray that you would help us during this season to to find our way. Father, we pray for young adults who've not yet returned to church. They're returning to work and other normal seas of life, but not church. God, would you remind them of the importance of being connected to the body? 
Father, for Mandy and her team, we pray you continue to give wisdom as they have to make decisions each week on, on what to do and how to best minister. I pray you give them that wisdom. I thank you for their faithfulness. And Father, I thank you for the privilege you've given us as the body of Christ to minister right here where you've placed us. Help us to be faithful in what you've called us to do. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. I want to be close, close to your side, so heaven is real, death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above, singing as one,
blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of his glory divine. My King, he is coming soon. He'll roll the clouds away. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Go on. today. God, whatever comes our way, may we praise your name all day long for who you are. God, for how much you loved us and showed that through your son, Jesus Christ. God, we thank you for the chance to give back today, to lift our voice. I may be a pleasing sound unto you today, for we love you. We thank you so much for loving us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. Well, what a difference a week makes. Happy to see faces in here this morning. Sure helps. Thankful for those of you joining us online as well. Let me invite your attention to Revelation chapter 8 this morning. While you're turning there, I just want to give you something extra this morning to make it worth your while for coming. You know, in Luke 8, uh, Jesus told the parable of the sower and the seed and uh, one of the things in that parable, in verse 5, he says that some of the seed fell along the path and the birds came and snatched it up. What did the seed represent? The gospel, it represented the, the word of God. 
And before it could take root and have any effect, the birds of the air devoured it. You know, that happens in every church every Sunday. God is putting his truth before us, but before we can get fully focused, distractions come and, and the truth gets snatched away. And I was thinking about something this week it, as far as eliminating distractions, and, and I don't mean to offend any of you. If, if this is what you choose to do, that's fine, but I just want to make a suggestion. Um, I think, you, you know, I, I get distracted too. When I'm sitting listening to someone else preach, I get distracted, but usually um, I'm sitting there with an open Bible, and when I get distracted, it's because of something else on that page. So when I get distracted, I'm at least distracted in and by the Word of God. And, and I want to say this morning, and again, this is just a suggestion, doesn't mean it has to work for everyone. Um, I know that many of you, uh, when I say turn to a passage, you get out your phone to turn to that passage. Doc? <laughs> that can be very distracting. Um, hopefully, you're turning off all your notifications, so if a text message comes through while you're looking at your Bible, that doesn't distract you or some other notification. But I'm going to tell you, there's something about, and, and I'm all about electronic. I, I've got a Kindle on my iPad. I do a lot of reading that way. But there's something about when it comes to the Word of God, having the Word of God open in my hand, uh, taking notes. Just a word this morning, maybe for you to think about if you're easily distracted, maybe it would be good, and, and I know it's... It's, it's a hassle to carry something this big and heavy around with you. I understand that. But maybe just something to think about if you're easily distracted during worship and during the time of the Word. Of, of perhaps it might be good just to do something different and carry a physical copy of the Word of God. Now, all you old people, don't start cheering. This is not just a young people issue. Okay? I've seen some of you doing it too, so don't go there. All right. I've meddled enough. Chapter 8. Verse 7, we're going to resume with the seven trumpets, the seventh seal um, that was opened by the Lord continues uh, God's wrath against mankind because mankind is still unrepentant. And the seven trumpets we'll go through today as well as the bowls that will follow in a couple weeks are all part of that seventh seal. Now, what you can see this morning is the first four trumpets, the first four judgments that come are forces of nature that are directed against the environment. Now, Will humanity suffer because of that? Yes, humanity is affected indirectly, but it's forces of nature that God uses against the environment. And you're going to notice it's very similar um, to the, the plagues, the things that happened in Egypt when Pharaoh would not let God's people go. The last three trumpets, five, six, and seven, are going to bring judgments that fall directly on humanity. And those judgments are carried out by demonic forces. They're not, they're not natural forces, they're demonic forces. Now, a common factor you're going to see in all of these judgments is the destruction of one-third. You'll see initially that one-third of the environment is affected. Then you'll see that one-third of humanity is destroyed. Now, why God chose one-third, I don't know, but that does remind us that these are not random events. If they're random events, we, who knows how many people would be destroyed? It'd be different in every event. No, this is a clear indication that God is in complete control. It shows that God is still giving mankind an opportunity to repent. After all that's happened, after all that he's done, after all the wake-ups, after all the warnings, mankind is still unrepentant, but God is patient. At any moment, he could end it all, and eventually he will, but he's patient, giving opportunity to repent. So in, instead of total destruction, which God is eventually going to do, th this fraction we're seeing here in these judgments is symbolic of God's mercy. The purpose of these judgments is not vengeance against mankind. God is still trying to wake people up, get them to learn from these tragic events, get them to, to repent and to turn to him. It's kind of like he's dealing with a stubborn child. If you've ever had a stubborn child, you know it seems like you have to keep upping the ante until you get their attention. And so God, because of the stubbornness of wicked men, is increasing the pressure progressively on mankind to try to wake them up. All right, chapter 8, verse 7, you see the first trumpet. It says, when the trumpet is blown, a storm of hail and fire mixed with blood is thrown upon the earth. And what's going to happen is that the hail, the fire, and the blood is going to burn and destroy a third 
of the remaining trees and grass. Well, is this literal? Is it literal that this is thrown, this storm is thrown from heaven to earth? Well, some think it might be the result of the earthquake back at the end of verse 5 where we left off last week. Maybe that earthquake caused volcanic eruptions and that caused the fire and and the hail and all that. Others say it's a result of meteors or something else in the, in the atmosphere. I would say to you, it doesn't really matter. In fact, a lot of what we're going to see, there, there are different ways of interpreting what the cause was. I would say it doesn't matter. The effect is the same. This storm is not a natural occurrence. This is something that God has done, and God can use any means he chooses to bring judgment. Now, What's the result? One result of this catastrophe, a third of all the grasses and and vegetations destroyed. Remember, we already have a major hit to the food supply. We talked about that last week. And so that's depleted even more as a third of all the crops are wiped out. Also, think about all the vegetation that's destroyed. The food for, for livestock, for animals is also destroyed. A third of it is all wiped out. Second trumpet, chapter 8, verses 8 and 9. John says something like, a mountain burning with fire is thrown into the sea. As a result, a third of the sea became blood, just like happened in Egypt. A third of the creatures die, and the third of the ships are destroyed. Now, notice John says, like a mountain. You remember we said a couple of weeks ago in the introduction that you're going to see words like like or as, because he's, he's trying to describe something as best he can in terms that we would be able to understand. He's seen things that have never been seen before, so there's no vocabulary for these things. So he's doing the best he could. And what you need to understand is John's descriptions are vivid, not to provide exact details for us to interpret. His, his uh, descriptions are vivid because he wants to put a vivid impression on our hearts of the visceral fear that people are going to face if they have denied the one true God. Think about what's, what's happening here. We, we don't know what the mountain is. Maybe, maybe it's a huge asteroid. You know, scientists have tracked asteroids as large as 500 miles wide that have tracked close enough to the earth that they could have entered our atmosphere. But whatever this thing is, it's got to be massive to do the damage it's doing to the oceans. Whatever this thing is, just the appearance of that in the sky coming down toward the earth would cause sheer terror and fright in the hearts of many. And the impact is devastating. He says it's going to wipe out a third of the oceans of the seas, the sea life, and the ships in them. Now, we know that the earth, the the makeup of the earth, about three quarters of the earth is oceans. And of the three quarters of the Earth's oceans, if you took a third of those oceans, that would be about the size of the entire Atlantic Ocean. So consider that all of the Atlantic turns to blood, all of the sea life in the Atlantic is is killed, dies. Again, remember, we've got a short food supply. The oceans are a great uh, part or significant source of our food supply. All the, the Atlantic turns to blood, all the sea life in the Atlantic is killed, All the ships in the Atlantic are destroyed. Why? I don't know. Maybe a massive tsunami. If something that big hits the waters, you can imagine the size of the tsunami it would cause. So every freighter, uh, every cargo ship, every uh, naval vessel, every yacht, every cruise ship, every small pleasure vessel, every every vessel on that third is completely destroyed. Third trumpet, chapter 8, verses 10 and 11. You see, he says, a great star fell, that star was named Wormwood. Wormwood is a a bitter plant in the Middle East. A star named Wormwood fell, burning like a torch. It fell on a third of the rivers and springs. This is now the fresh water. The waters became Wormwood. They became bitter, and many died from drinking the bitter water. We don't know what this was, but it was sent by God. And as a result, a third of all the fresh water supply is now polluted. Fourth trumpet, chapter 8, verse 12. A third of the sun and the moon and the stars are struck so that they are darkened. A third of the day and the third of night did not shine. A third of the day. Um, this morning, uh, sunrise was at 6.30-something, uh, 36, 39. Sunset's about 6.03. So let's just say 12 hours of, of daylight. All of a sudden, you've lost four hours. You have an eight-hour period of daylight. If the sun rose at 6, 
It's gone at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. A third of the day and a third of the night did not shine. What it means about the night not shining is a third of the night would be completely pitch black, no moon, no stars. The one who said, let there be light, decided to cause the light to diminish by a third. And so daylight's diminished by a third, reduced by a third. All the available light that we have now is reduced by a third. I wonder how well solar power is going to work when that happens. What about not solar power as far as is heating our homes? But what about the solar heating of the earth? What about the temperature of the earth? What do you think is going to happen when a third of all the light is gone? I'm going to say something. I, I've said something similar to this once before, made a few people upset. But what about global warming and climate change? That's not going to be a worry at this point. And and I'll tell you, I'm all about taking care. God gave us dominion over the earth. I'm all about taking care of the earth, taking care of the climate. We do it better than any country in the world. But I'm so tired of all this talk. It's not global warming anymore. It's climate change because obviously it's not warming. Look at last week. But listen, man is not going to destroy the earth. God is going to destroy the earth. We need to do everything we can to take care of this world that God has given us, but we need to stop all this ridiculous talk about global warming and the earth burning up and climate change. That's God's deal. That's not our deal. Paul, I hope you'll support me. Amen in me. I hope you'll support me when I don't have a job because people get mad that I spoke against climate change. Verse 13, he sees an eagle uh, flying through the sky, and the eagle's saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. What is woe? Well, woe is some kind of grievous distress or affliction. It, it, he's, the eagle's warning of what's coming. The final three trumpets are going to be worse than the, than the first four. Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth. Now, that phrase, those who dwell on the earth, that's not just talking about people who are still alive on the earth. Those who dwell on the earth means those who make the earth their home, those who are living for this world, those whose citizenship is the earth, not heaven. Those who are in rebellion against God, woe to them. And what happens in chapter 9? All hell breaks loose. That's not just a phrase, that's very literal. All of hell is going to be unleashed on mankind. Look at trumpet 5 in verses 1 through 12. John says he sees a star fallen. Notice it doesn't say falling, it says fallen, that's past tense. He sees a star fallen in the past. So from from this vision he's having in the tribulation period, he's seeing a star that has fallen in the past. Now, this star is not an object. It's not like the third trumpet when the star named Wormwood fell and, and polluted the waters. It's not an object. This star is a person who has fallen. You see, he says he's given the key to the bottomless pit. This star is none other than Satan fallen from heaven in the past. The bottomless pit is the abyss. What is the abyss? Well, 2 Peter 2, 4 tells us that the abyss is the place where God sent the angels who sinned, who rebelled against him. Now, yes, there are, angel, or excuse me, there are demons, angels who sinned are demons. There are demons who are free today. They're carrying out Satan's agenda. But 2 Peter 2, 4 tells us that there are many that are imprisoned in the abyss and they are confined there in chains. And so get the picture, these demons confined in the abyss have been imprisoned there for thousands of years and they are eager to be released so they can wreak havoc on the earth and on its inhabitants whom Satan hates. He says that Satan is given the key to do what? To open the abyss and to release them. Now, recognize Satan is given the key. What does that tell you? He didn't have the key. He doesn't have access to the key. God is in complete control. God is allowing, God is orchestrating these events that are taking place. He's given the key. He opens the abyss. You see that smoke pours out, even darkening the sun. But the description of what comes out of the abyss next is is frightening. Look at it. These creatures are long-haired, they're horse-shaped, they're, they're flying locusts with scorpion tails, golden crowns above human faces, teeth like a lion, wearing armor. They're a combination of, uh, of horse and man and lion and scorpion and, and locust, and they're large. 
And he says they are led, this is another reason we know these are demons, they are led by a demon king. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, Apollyon in Greek, both names mean destroyer. So you have a, a large army uh, of very perverse and powerful demons led by their king, their leader, the destroyer. What are they going to do? Look back at the text. They're not going to harm vegetation like locusts normally do. They're going to harm people. They're going to inflict pain on all those who don't belong to God. They have the power of the scorpion. They will sting people and cause pain so incredible that those who are stung will wish to die and will even attempt suicide in various ways, adding to their pain, but they will not be able to die. They will suffer for five months. You know what, you know what that is? That is a preview of the coming eternal judgment of those who don't come to Christ. Only it won't be five months. It will be all of eternity that they will suffer in horrible, incredible pain, not just physically, but mentally and spiritually because they're separated from the God who made them for him and can never be reunited to him and made right with him again. And that suffering won't go on for five months. It will go on for all of eternity. They will wish to die. They will wish that their life would just end, that they would be extinguished and go into oblivion, but it will never happen. Your friends and my friends who don't come to Christ will suffer for all of eternity. This is a preview of eternal judgment. Trumpet number 6, chapter 9, verses 13 through 19. The order is given to release the four angels bound at the Euphrates. Now again, uh, these are, are angels at this point. They're demons. They're, they're fallen angels. You see that they've been bound or restrained. Ho holy angels are not bound. So these are demons that are now being released. And what are they going to do? They're leading an army that's being assembled, and this army is going to attack the inhabitants of earth. Again, these judgments come directly against mankind, and they're led by demons. What do we know? This is a demonic army. It's an army of 200 million, and they're going to kill a third of the remaining population. Now, the army has the characteristics of a human army, but they're more, they're more supernatural than they are a natural look. The horses have heads like lions. From their mouths come fire and smoke and brimstone. Their, their tails are like serpents. Now, some have tried to say, have looked at this and trying to figure out from John's description, they've tried to say, well, John, John was describing an army or army equipment that, that is so advanced with military weapons. They didn't exist in his day. He, he couldn't picture that, and, and they try to say, well, it was some kind of, a, a, of airship that had all these weapons and, and on the back they could fire stinger missiles, whatever. Listen, Scripture makes clear this is nothing less than a demonic army of fallen angels. I don't care how it appears or what it looks like. This is God judging mankind, and, and it says a third of the remaining population is killed. Now, let's back up to last week. Do you remember last week that a quarter of the population was killed when the fourth seal was open. Assuming today's population of 8 billion people, a quarter was killed. When that fourth seal was open, that would be 2 billion people. There are 6 billion left. A third now of the remaining 6 billion means another 2 billion people are going to be killed by this army. So in short, in a very uh, short number of years or months, half of the earth's population has been wiped out. And look at the response, just like what we saw at the end of chapter 7 during that great earthquake. Look how those who survived respond. They did not repent of the work of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or thefts. What's happening? Their hearts are hardened even more. See, what God is doing to try to wake humankind up, to try to help them recognize their need, to try to help them recognize who he is, try to draw them to repentance, instead they are hardening their hearts toward him him they're coming to a place where they just cannot believe and yet in the midst of all the judgment there's still grace and mercy and opportunity for redemption and so in chapter 10 we we come to to an interlude it, it's a stop in the progression of judgment 
as John shares a, a personal vision that, that he has seen. And in 10, 1 through 4, you see he tells us that there was another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud. Clouds are symbolic of judgment, a rainbow over his head, a reminder of God's covenant with his people. This mighty angel holds a little scroll. When he speaks, it's like a lion roaring and seven thunders sound. Now look what this angel does. He, he makes an oath. He's invoking the name of him who lives forever, the almighty creator. In other words, he's saying this, this in God's name, this is what's going to happen. Look what he says. There will be no more delay. Of what? Of judgment. We think we've seen God's wrath. We've seen nothing compared to what's happening when he pours out his wrath in, in the bold judgments. And, and perhaps at that time, there's no more opportunity for redemption. You see, God, through, through the seals and through the trumpets, God has been screaming to people who have rejected him, repent, repent, repent. He's been warning them and, and screaming at them to repent. He's, he's given them patience, but as patience has been tried, there's going to be no more delay. Well, what's the little scroll? Scripture doesn't tell us. Perhaps it's God's revelation of the prophetic message uh, that John's going to record from chapters 11 through 22. Perhaps it's the scroll that the Lamb opened. Now that all the seals have been opened, perhaps it's that scroll. But you notice that John is told to eat the book or the scroll. What does that symbolize? It symbolizes the, the taking in of the message, reading and learning and inwardly digesting. Why? In order to be ready to prophesy. John says it tastes sweet, and he was warned of this, it tastes sweet. Why? Because it's God's message. But in his stomach it turns to bitterness because of the wrath and the judgment and the sorrow that's coming. If only God would fill the stomachs of believers today with bitterness because of the wrath and the sorrow and judgment coming upon their friends and neighbors and co-workers and family. John is, is sickened by this vision, and so he's reminded, you see in verse 11, of his commission. You must again prophesy. What's he prophesying? Of judgments that are coming. You must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. You know, we, like John, have to be faithful in proclaiming God's message to people in our day. We, we call the gospel good news. The gospel is good news to those who believe. But it's very bad news to those who continue to reject and refuse to believe. We have to speak the whole truth to people, even the bitter parts. Obviously, we have to be careful how we do that, but we can't shy away from making sure they understand what's to come for those who refuse to believe. One final note, because I kind of skipped over this, back up in verses 3 and 4, one final note from chapter 10. The voice of the angel, we're told, is followed by the sound of seven thunders. Now, we don't know what the seven thunders communicated. Typically, thunder is associated with judgment. But if it was a pronouncement of judgment, we don't know that because, look, John is told to seal it up and not to write it down. And we don't know. John's given the message, and in this case, he's told not to write it down. Listen, the message doesn't belong to, to John. The message belongs to God. God alone has full authority, and God is in control. Have I, have I said that a few times today yet? That's a great reminder for us in our day, isn't it? God is in control. It's a great reminder for you if your life is falling apart at this moment. If you're a child of God and you're walking with God, know that God is in control and he has a plan and purpose even for what you're going through and what you're suffering. God is in control. Chapter 11, he continues with the vision, verses 1 and 2. He says that he's told to measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. That's the holy place, not the holy of holies, but the holy place where the altar of sacrifice is. But not to measure the court outside of the temple, for it's given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city 
for 42 months. Now, what, what temple is, God, is John measuring? There, there are several different views on this temple. Some try to say, well, the temple refers to the church. I've told you before, I don't, I don't believe in replacement theology. I don't think the church has replaced Israel. I don't think that's it. Some have said, well, it's the, the second Jewish temple, the Herodian temple. I, I don't think so. The most likely view is John is talking about a literal earthly temple that is going to stand in Jerusalem during the tribulation. I mentioned Daniel last week and the close ties between Daniel's prophecy and Revelation. And Daniel, he refers to a temple, even though the temple is not standing in his time, he refers to a temple where there are sacrifices made and where desecration occurs. And, and he says that temple is in the 70th week. It looks like Daniel is looking ahead to this seven years and saying there's going to be a literal temple. And so I think John is also looking forward to a future temple that didn't exist in his day. Well, how's that going to happen? You know that preparations are being made right now in Israel to rebuild the temple? Well, what about the Dome of the Rock? If you've, if you've been to Israel or seen pictures, you know there on the Temple Mount is, is a very holy Muslim place, the Dome of the Rock. Most who have studied the layout of the Temple Mount agree and believe that the Dome of the Rock is not in the exact location of the Temple site. Some would say, well, the Dome of the Rock would have to be destroyed. That's going to cause a holy war. Not necessarily. We don't know how it's going to happen. We don't know how the difficulties will be resolved. But if there's going to be a temple during the time of the tribulation, God will make a way for that to happen. So why is John to measure the temple? Well, measuring symbolizes ownership. It's symbolizing protection, uh, preservation. It also means of, of checking to see if, if something or, or someone meets a standard. Well, if the temple is rebuilt in Jerusalem, it's very likely the sacrificial system is also going to be brought back. It appears that God is going to protect a remnant of those who worship him. We're, we're going to get to that remnant in, of, of Jews in chapter 12, that remnant who will survive. But it appears that God is going to protect a, a remnant. And so he tells them to measure the place where the Jews would be to worship him, but not the outer court. Because the outer court represents those who remain in the world and are going to be ravaged because of all the revolt against God. For 42 months, that's three and a half years, he says they will trample the holy city. Chapter 11, verses 3 through 14, John says there are two witnesses who are going to prophesy for three and a half years. Listen, the, these witnesses are not metaphorical. The text indicates these are going to be literal people, two human beings who will serve God during this time. Listen, Satan has his two henchmen. He has the, the beast and the false prophet. God also has his two representatives that are going to counteract the evil uh, of the beast and the false prophet. Now, scholars disagree on, on who the two will be. Some say Joshua and Zerubbabel. Some say Enoch and Elijah. Um, I believe Moses and Elijah. Because if you look at the miracles that, that these two witnesses perform, they're pretty much identical to those that perform by Moses and Elijah during their periods of, of ministry on the earth. Malachi 4.5, God says, Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord, the great tribulation in the last three and a half years. Moses and Elijah were the two that appeared with Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration, and that was a kind of a prefigure of Christ's second coming to earth. So these two witnesses, what do they do? Well, you see, Scripture says they're divinely shielded from harm. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths. By the way, Moses and Elijah both were able to call down fire on people who opposed them during their earthly ministries. Verse 6, they're given supernatural power. They can say, no rain, as Elijah did. They can turn water to blood, as Moses did. They can call down plagues whenever they want. What's, what's their main ministry? What are they doing? Their main ministry is a prophetic utterance to encourage people to repent. Again, God is trying to get the message across, but their main ministry is also judgment. 
because of all these plagues and, and, and the judgment they can call down on, on people on earth. So the people on earth hate them. Most don't respond to their message. They, they hate them and they want to harm them, but God will not allow anyone to harm them until their ministry is complete. Look at the text, what happens when their ministry is complete. God allows the Antichrist to, to kill them. And that act probably wins him tremendous favor and support because he's ridding the world of these two menaces. And so their bodies lie in the street. It's just an act of, of disgrace. They, they won't pick up the bodies. They won't bury them. And you look in verses 9 and 10, if you need another reminder of how wicked the world is at this point, they're having a celebration. It's, it's Christmas. They're gloating all around the world, I guess through, through satellite, through television, through internet. Everyone is seeing these, these dead bodies, and they're celebrating. They're giving each other gifts as if it's Christmas time. Three days later, that joy turns to fear because as the witnesses are resurrected by God and ascend into heaven, the wicked city is judged. There's this massive earthquake that demolishes a tenth of the city and 7,000 people are killed. But there's a word of encouragement here. Look at this. This is an unusual response in verse 13. You remember that in, in previous disasters, hearts were hardened. People did not turn to God what it says in verse 13. The rest, those who were not killed, were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. So, so the survivors acknowledge God and even give him glory. There, there's at least one positive response to the work of the witnesses. You know, it's conceivable that some even were moved to repentance and salvation. That's God's whole goal during all this judgment. Chapter 11, verse 15. Seventh trumpet is blown. It's going to lead, we'll get to in a couple of weeks, the bowls of wrath being poured out. But you notice in heaven it leads to an outburst of rejoicing. The seventh trumpet is blown. It leads to a victory celebration. Why? Because the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. 24 elders are celebrating God's power, his overthrow of the raging nations, his judgment of the dead, his rewarding of the faithful. And then look at verse 19. John tells us God's temple in heaven was opened and the ark of the covenant was seen within his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake and heavy hail. The ark of the covenant is visible. What's the significance? Well, the ark of the covenant was the sign of God's presence with his people. You saw that all through the Old Testament, that the Ark of the Covenant was his presence. The Ark of the Covenant being seen as a reminder that God is present and God is faithful to his people in every generation. Always has been, always will be. Now, it kind of looks like we, we've hit the end. If, if John had stopped right there, we would have thought that Revelation ended properly, but we're only halfway through. There, there's 11 more chapters to come. Next week, we're going to see John's vision shift to, to another perspective, beginning there in verse 12. Now, I think I said this early on, but let me remind you that John's vision, what he records, is not always linear and sequential. Sometimes he backs up or shows a different view or a, or a different perspective. But what we need to understand is that God has given us an incredible gift in the book of Revelation. He has given us a glimpse into the last chapters of human history, and, and we can see current events that are happening even now and not wonder where it's going to end up. We, we know God has graciously shown us the conclusion. Well, why is that, and, and what do we draw from that? Let me just share four things with you this morning as we wrap it up. I think the first thing that God has blessed us with and showing us what's going to happen at the end is just this reminder God is in control. Have I mentioned that yet? Say that with me. God is in control. You that are in the venue and online, if you didn't say it that time, let's all say it together again. God is in control. 
Listen, the sins of man and, and the schemes of Satan will never prevent his will being done. It's going to be done. That's why we're instructed in Scripture not to be foolish, but to know the will of the Lord, because that is what's going to be accomplished. I'll tell you a second thing that, that Revelation says to me. I need, we need, to thank God for his mercy. Isn't it amazing that even in all these judgments, he's still exhibiting mercy. And, and we can look at what's happening. We can look at how evil these people are and say, man, that's an amazing thing that God would give them mercy. But listen, we've been rebellious. We've been ungrateful. We were in need of mercy and still are. We need to thank God for his mercy. We need to thank God for enabling us to receive salvation. You, you can't come to God apart from the work of Christ, apart from the work of the Spirit. No one comes to God unless the Spirit draws them. We've been saved very long at all. We forget what God has done in enabling us to receive salvation so we can be spared from his wrath. And finally, I would say Revelation reminds us of the need to tell those without Christ of God's love for them but also to warn them about what happens to those who reject Christ. We have to speak the truth. We have to speak the full gospel of Christ. Would you bow with me? It's almost overwhelming, isn't it? All of these things that are, that are happening in such rapid succession. It's incredible calamity and, and devastation and judgment. And yet, in the midst of all that, God is being gracious and merciful and giving people the opportunity to turn to Christ. But why wait? Why, why run the risk? Why, why if, if you have not given your life to Christ as Lord and Savior, why would you dare run the risk of saying, well, I'll, I'll see if, you know, if this stuff in the Bible really happens, then, then I'll trust Christ. Well, is that a risk to take? Why wait? Why say, well, you know, I'm, I'm not brave enough to speak to that neighbor. I'm afraid my coworkers will ridicule me. Maybe they'll have opportunity. Maybe they'll recognize when these things start happening. Is that a risk your friend or neighbor would want you to take with their life? Thank God that we received his mercy because we were just as rebellious. We were just as far from him as these people in Revelation. Thank God that his Holy Spirit drew us, that people were praying for us, that his spirit would draw us, that we'd receive the message. The message was not for us to hoard we're blessed to be a blessing. Every good thing we have is from the Father. And it's not just for us, it's to be shared, it's to be a blessing. How could we not speak forth the truth about our great salvation when we understand what is to come? Maybe for you today, you're in a, a great struggle and you just needed to hear a word of encouragement from the Lord. I've got this. I'm in control. Yes, I understand that what's happening right now is not what you would desire. I understand it's difficult. I understand it's painful. But, but trust me, I'm working in your life. And, and remember that my work in your life, the most important part of my work in your life is my eternal work, not the temporal things today. It's the Spirit of God said to you this morning. How do you need to respond?
Holy Spirit, you not only author this book, you indwell each believer individually and personally. You know us. Meet us at our point of need. Speak the truth into our hearts and lives where we need it and help us to respond to what you have to say. Just stand as we respond together, church. When the stars burn down and the earth wears out and we stand before the throne with the witnesses who have gone before we will rise in all of love sing me blessing and honor and glory and power forever to our God sing me blessing and honor and glory and power forever to our God when the hands of time wind fully down and the earth rolled up like a scroll the trumpets will fall and the world will fall to its knees appreciate our pastor and the word he brings every week. What a blessing. And uh, studying through Revelation, uh, it's, it's over my head, but I appreciate the interpretation and the chance to get back and worship with the songs. Revelation's a great book from a worship pastor standpoint. I'm just saying it's good. We're going to keep singing as you leave. Have a great week. We'll see you together next Sunday. All right. I'm John Skelly, worship pastor here at Geyer Springs, and I want to thank you for joining us for our online blended service. We want to help connect you with our church and give you all the information that you might need. If you'll text GSFEC in your name to 94000, you'll receive three important links. The first link is the Sunday Hub, which includes a bulletin and other important links like online giving. The second link you'll receive is our connection card where you'll have an opportunity to give more information about yourself so that we as a church will best know how to minister and serve you and your family. 
The third and final link is a chance for you to submit prayer requests. This will give our team an opportunity to pray for you throughout the week. Thanks again for joining us for our online service. We hope you have a great week and look forward to you joining with us again next Sunday.